Wow, what a great privilege it is to be here today. Uh, certainly, I'm blessed to be here, and what a great time to be alive and a great time to take advantage of some of the opportunities that we have going on uh, in our world today. Before I get started, uh, there's certainly someone here that came along with me that is my care provider, uh, and that is my wife in the back, and that's uh, Peggy, if you can just kind of wave your hand. <clears throat> You know, I'm entering this room and, you know, I come in and didn't think I would know anyone. And three years ago, I was, well, about four years ago, I was out of coaching, had just finished up at Kentucky State. And me and my family was on this beach um, in Florida. So the time we was there, the weekend we was there, it rained the whole weekend. I've got three daughters. And when they think of Florida, they think of beach, sun, ocean. But it rained the whole time, so we didn't get to go out on the beach. And the last day that we were there, the sun pops out. Everybody comes running out of the condos. It was like coming off the ark or something. You got all these people paired up trying to get to the beach. I go down early because I see the sun popping up and, I, and I'm going down there to reserve a spot because you got to reserve a spot because if you don't, the beach is too crowded, you won't get a spot, you won't get an umbrella, umbrella and you will bake. So I went down, I reserved a spot and I said, uh, gentlemen, I, I need an umbrella and I need a few chairs. And he said, okay, I'll set you down here. So I rushed back up to get the family and to bring them down. And, set the umbrella down, and just as I set the umbrella down, this lady comes out from under another umbrella and looks at me and says, uh, aren't you that Kentucky player? Now, we're in Florida. I'm not expecting anybody to recognize me or know where I am. And I said, ma'am, Kentucky player? Who, who are you speaking of? Well, you're that Winston Bennett, aren't you? <laughs> I'm like, my gosh, we're in Florida. What, what was it, Destin, I think? That young lady is here today, and she's sitting over here. But the, the essence of that story, the essence of that story was this. When she came out, just before she came out, I had received this call from an athletic director because, as I said, at that time, I was out of coaching. And the athletic director was a place from, from a place called Mid-Continent University from Mayfield, Kentucky. Now, I never heard of Mayfield, Kentucky, and I had never heard of Mid-Continent University. So I had talked to the gentleman, as I said, went down to the beach, got the umbrella and everything, and now this beautiful young lady comes out from under the umbrella. And here's what she said. She said, uh, you're that Kentucky ball player. Yes, ma'am, I'm that Kentucky ball player. I am Winston Bennett. And, she said, and I said, uh, well, ma'am, where are you from? She says, well, I'm from Mayfield, Kentucky. I said, what? I just talked to a guy from Mayfield, Kentucky. I never heard of Mayfield, Kentucky in my life. Now, already in the past hour, I've heard of it twice. And she said, I got a daughter that went to a, a great school down there. I said, what school, ma'am? Well, she went to Mid-Continent University. I said, what? I was just offered a coaching position at Mid-Continent University. So how bizarre is that? So fate does happen. Let me tell you something. Uh, I'm going to take you back in the beginning of my life, and I, I, I know that you all are in some role as a provider, whether it's working um, with companies, retirement companies, retirement homes, or, 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 or being a part of healthcare in some form or fashion. When I was younger, my father, uh, who is with us today, he would set me on the side of this bed. And there'd be a Kentucky game playing on TV. Now, I'm about six years old. He'd set me on the side of this bed. Kentucky was playing on TV. He'd roll up two socks. He'd roll these two socks up, and he'd shoot the socks over this door. We had about a seven-foot door uh, that fit next to a wall with about an eight-inch space in between. Now, I'm six years old. I'm about yay high. He'd lay in the bed, and he'd shoot this sock over the door. I'd jump up and try to block the sock at six. We'd watch that Kentucky game. I would emulate those players, and he'd always pose this question. He'd say, Winston, can you see yourself being there one day? I'm six years old. 
How in the world am I going to see, what, 14, 15 years down the road actually playing for the University of Kentucky and going on and possibly playing professionally? But it didn't happen one time. It happened continuously. He'd set me there and always say, Winston, can you see yourself being there? Little did I know then what I know now. He was teaching me something called vision. Having a vision for my life. Not being content with where I was, with just playing with G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip and my little Tonka toy trucks. He saw far on down the road of me being something more than I was at that point in time. That took me to, back then they had something uh, with a little gold that had suction cups on the end. Uh, I used to stick it on my mirror in my room. Nerf basketball hoop. They still have that, anybody know? I mean, that thing has been stood the ages of time, the test of time. I would take that little squeezy ball, that little Nerf hoop, because back then, we had a guy uh, in the ABA called Dr. J. Dr. J had these huge hands and could jump. He was the, the Kobe Bryant or the LeBron James before there was. And this guy would finger roll that ball over the rim and dunk on people, and I wanted to be like the doctor. So I'd go in my room and I'd pretend I was Dr. J, and again, not knowing that I was living in that vision my father told me of Winston, can you see yourself being there? I would run from that room, I'd grab a basketball, and I started shooting in the garbage can, pretending I was already where I was seeing on TV. And I always, when I'm out speaking, particularly to young people, and even to adults, because when we get adulthood, we've been through so much that we stop dreaming and we stop wanting more. We start to get complacent and content with where we are. But I, I have to put it out there that what are you seeing for yourself? Are you content with where you are? Don't be, because there's so much more to learn. There's so much more to gain. There's so many more people to help, because I, I'm one of those people that feel like we're all here for others. Who can I help? Who can I give an encouraging word, word to? And we all know some young person out there today that's trying to find himself or herself. As I go throughout Kentucky and speaking at schools, I get to see a lot of different things. I get to see some promising young people, but then I also get to see some young people that has already lost their zest for life. Whether they come from less than heralded backgrounds, where maybe in a lot of cases, you've got kids rearing themselves, rearing themselves, bringing themselves up. So that's tough. So back to my story. Dad was saying, can you see it? Can you see it? And there I was, pretending. I was emulating the doctor. And I was emulating guys like Dan Issel, uh, 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 Rick Mount, and Louis Dampier, who played here in Kentucky. Just started to have a vision, a dream of where I wanted to be. Not only on the basketball court, but I had this lady in my life. And she, she would say this, Winston, basketball is good. I like the game of basketball. But I want to know, after about, if you're lucky enough to play professional basketball, what are you going to do when that ball starts bouncing, young man? That lady was my mom. My mom passed away about three years ago, but left me with a treasure chest of wisdom and knowledge that I still carry with me to this day. She would say, son, you can do anything you want to do if you put your mind to doing it. If you're willing to put the sweat equity into it, you can make it happen. So that's what I did when it came to my academics and when it came to basketball. That little Nerf basketball hoop led me to Mel High School in Louisville. Senior year was voted Mr. Basketball in the state of Kentucky. That little Nerf basketball hoop and shooting in that garbage can led me to the Big Blue Nation, the University of Kentucky, 1983. I was able to play for the Big Blue. And if you remember, if any of you guys are, are Kentucky fans, 83-84 was a great year at Kentucky. We were able to play in the Final Four in Seattle. Played against a team called the Georgetown Hoyas. They had a guy named Patrick Ewan. It was the year of the big men. We had the Twin Towers, Bowie and Turpin. They had Patrick Ewing. And then the other two teams was uh, Virginia with Ralph Sampson 
And then the Houston Cougars with Akeem Olajuwon. So it was the year of the big man. We went in that game full of confidence, ready to win. And first half, we were up on them. But we all know that in one half, a game is not won. So we came out the second half and shot a horrible percentage and ended up losing an opportunity to go on to the championship round. For me as a player, I never was able to get back to a Final Four or to win a championship. But I felt like I won a championship because in 1988, I walked away with my degree from the University of Kentucky, my degree in business. And I remember that senior year, we were in practice. We had a guy named Ed Davner. Ed Davner was from Brooklyn, New York. If you know anything about New York basketball players, they're like Metal Art Lemon. Have you ever seen the Harlem Globetrotters or heard about them? Metal Art Lemon is that guy and Curly Neal. They dribbling that ball through the legs, behind the back, doing crazy stuff. That was it. It come down the court, he'd do something crazy and throw the ball up and it was my job to grab the ball and take it off that backboard. I was a rebounder. Still today, I call myself a rebounder. If you're gonna make it in life, you gotta be a rebounder. You gotta be able to get up after you've been knocked down. You gotta be able to go up and get the ball after it's been shot. So he shot the ball, I rebounded the ball, and just as I turned, this being my senior year, the year that I was supposed to provide the leadership, one of my teammates fell right in the side of my knee. Like a clipping play that you see in football, senior year. Everything that I'd worked hard for, all my dad's advice of, Winston, can you see it? Can you see yourself being there? Now it seemed like it was snatched right out from under me. All of us sitting in this room today have had those moments where we've been clipped, where something has happened unforeseen, whether it's an unforeseen bill that we didn't know was coming, something's happened in our family where we've lost a loved one, our sickness has hit our family. That messenger of misery always comes to us in some form or fashion. So it's not a question of when he comes, it's just what are you going to do when it hits? Are you prepared for those moments? I was very unprepared for a moment like that because I had put all my energy into success, wanting to get there, wanting to make it to help my team win a championship and go on to the NBA. But then the words of my mother came back and said, Winston, Without your education, son, you're going to have a very difficult time making it. So I kept hearing that education, education. So I was always a fairly good student. But when that injury happened, I went from, like the book, good to great. I realized that my education was the foundation of all success and that without that, there was no opportunity for me to have any form of success. So I walked away with that degree. I was very fortunate that I had what was called in college basketball as a red shirt year. When you get injured, you have an opportunity to go to the NCAA, let them know that you got injured and possibly get that year back. I was able to do that. I was able to get into rehab and rehab my knee and start with little simple things as leg lifts starting trying to walk again after surgery. Very difficult. Seemed like very meaningless task. But nine months later, I was back on the court. And I had a chance to play out that senior year. And a great thing happened. Dad's Can You See It at Six came a reality as I got drafted in the NBA. I remember being in practice one day, and we had the Hall of Fame coach, Lenny Wilkins, as our coach. Coach Wilkins comes up to me one day and says, hey, Winston, hey, Winston. He says, I acknowledge all the pain and the hurt that you had to go through at the University of Kentucky, tearing your knee up. He says, I acknowledge all the things that you had to overcome. You wasn't one of those guys that just went from high school and went to the NBA, but you went through college, you got your degree. He said, I want to give you a reward for your perseverance. And I'm thinking, reward? <laughs> NBA? Cha-ching! You know what a roar means in the NBA? It's big dollars. So I'm thinking, I'm about ready to get Shaq daddy money. I'm about ready to get mom the house on the hill, few investments in Edward Jones, lay back and really set things up. But that wasn't what Coach Wilkins was thinking at all. What he was thinking was, 
He said, I'm going to start you in your first NBA basketball game. And I was like, oh, little kid from Louisville, Kentucky, whose dad said, can you see it, is now about to start in the NBA? That to me was as if he had just given me a million dollars. That was my dream. That was my can you see it. Now I was there. The dream was set at six. The reality came at 22, 23. So all that abyss and tests and trials and jumping over hurdles and obstacles came in between, but now I'm there. So I'm so excited. I run from that meeting. I run to the nearest pay phone, call ATT, call collect. I'm still just a first year player in the NBA making minimum wage salary, although minimum wage salary in the NBA is pretty good. So I call back to, the, I call back to Louisville, Kentucky, and you know who answers the phone. It's dear old dad. Hello? Hey, dad, it's your son up in Cleveland. Hey, son, how's it going? Dad, it's going great. I'm about to get a reward in the NBA. <gasps> what? Yeah. What's it going to be, son? What's it going to be? Dad, I'm about to start in the NBA. And that starts a little reminiscing process that goes on for a few moments. And he begins to say, Winston, Winston, he said, do you remember when you used to emulate Dr. J on your puff basketball hoop? Do you remember when you used to shoot baskets in a garbage can? But here's what got me. He says, do you remember when I used to always pose the question, can you see? You see, it doesn't matter what age you are, what your station is in life, what are you seeing? Because as long as we're here, we've got to keep expanding. We've got to keep stretching. We've got to keep learning. We've got to keep helping. Can you see it? What are you seeing? What's important to you? How can we get better as a company? How can we get better in our field of endeavor? What are you seeing? So there I was, excited, hung up the phone, and it occurred to me, the boy was just like me. Oh, you remember that song, Cats in the Cradle? Oh, you guys are old enough to remember that. So I, I, I hung up the phone, I ran from the meeting, I went back to the locker room, and I hadn't given thought as to who this great reward was going to come against. I was like, oh my gosh, if, if I'm gonna get a reward in the NBA, first little kid from Louisville, Kentucky, first time in the NBA, first time starting, I'm thinking, okay, it's got to be against one of the worst teams in the league. So I looked to California. It's got to be against the Golden State Warriors. They're about 0 45. That'll be a good team for me to start against. So when I looked on the schedule, it wasn't the Golden State Warriors. I said, okay, uh, there's another bad team in California. It's got to be the LA Clippers. They're 0 46. <laughs> wasn't the Clippers. When I looked at third time, I said we were to play the world champion Chicago Bulls. <laughs> Boom, I fell out. The Bulls? Are you kidding me? Do you know who plays for the Bulls? Do you know that they win championships? They don't just win games. And you're gonna start me against the Bulls? So after they douse me with water and I wake up, <laughs> Coach Wilkins is up at the blackboard putting up the assignments. He says, Brad Doherty, who is our center, you guard Bill Cartwright, Larry Nance, who is our forward, you guard Horace Grant, and he says, Craig Elo, who is, who is really our two guard, you guard Scottie Pippen, and my hand went up. Hey, coach, wait a minute. You said you was going to start me. I'm the small forward for the Cavaliers. Craig is our two guard. Scottie Pippen is the small forward for the Bulls. Me and Scottie should be guarding one another. I'm internalizing this. I'm not ready to blow my big opportunity. So he goes on and he says, Mark Price, I want you to guard B.J. Armstrong. By now I'm jumping up and down. I'm saying, wait, coach, coach. There's only one guy left to guard. And I know you're not putting me on him. And he says, Winston Bennett, you guard Michael Jordan. Boom, I fell out again. I said, wait a minute. I done fell out twice. That ought to be sign enough, coach, for you not to play me tonight. <laughs> but he stuck with me. How many know in life you got to have some people that will stick with you, even when you're not exuding the confidence that you should, even when you see things that, you know, just don't look like I can get it done? You got to have those people that will push you and nudge you in the right direction, say, yes, you can get it done. 
we can get this done, if we play as a team, if we work as a team, the thing that looks like it's, it, it can't be accomplished can be accomplished. Why? Because we're going in the same direction. We're trying to win the trophy. We're trying to be the best healthcare company that can be. We're trying to have the best senior facilities that we can produce for people. So there I was. Had this overwhelming task of playing against the Bulls and playing the world greatest player. So we're walking through the court, out to the court, and I'm concerned with one thing. What does Michael Jordan look like before a game? So as I sneak a look over, the Bulls are walking through at the same time, and I look at Jordan, and Jordan's just chewing this bubblicious bubble gum 90 miles an hour. It was like he didn't know me, he had no concern with me, I'm concerned with him. So we get out on the court, Bulls go to one end, Cavaliers at the other end, I'm still concerned about Jordan. Well, Jordan's putting up three-point shots, swish, swish. Meanwhile, I'm shooting air balls, bloop. Blue. Not only that, I'm glad you guys had your lunch already. I've got so many butterflies flying through my stomach that I come down with diarrhea. So, so the team manager is walking me back and forth to the locker room, giving me the Maalox Plus and the Pepto-Bismol. It takes them about a half an hour to get me from irregular to regular, and, and, and we come back out. And we come back out, we go to the middle of the floor, and. You know how it is just before a game, you see guys giving high fives and giving dap and all that. I didn't know, I, 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 nobody told me. I, I, I brought out my pen and paper and said, Mr. Jordan, can I please have your autograph? <laughs> so now I've embarrassed my teammates, I've embarrassed my coach, and we still gotta play the Bulls. Referee tosses up the ball, first play of the game. You know who it goes to, it goes to Jordan. Well, Jordan comes over the mid-court line. You know the first thing he does? He licks out that darn tongue. And saliva's coming all off his tongue. He's looking at me like I'm a baked potato and porterhouse house steak, and he's gonna carve me up for dinner. Meanwhile, I'm sliding like Joe B. Hall and Eddie Sutton taught me at Kentucky. As Jordan throws it over to Pippen, Pippen to BJ, back out to Jordan, Jordan shoots. It's no good. Brad Doherty gets the rebound, he outlets it to Mark Price over to Craig Elo, Craig Elo to Winston Bennett, Winston Bennett shoots. It's good. Well, the Bulls go back down, it's Jordan to Pippen, Pippen to BJ, back to Jordan, Jordan shoots, it's good, it's no good again. Brad Doherty gets it, out to Mark Price, Price finds Elo, he finds Bennett, Bennett pulls up again, it's good. I'm thinking, cha-ching. <laughs> I'm gonna be the next guy on the Wheaties box. I'm going to be walking around in my Hanes underwear commercial. <laughs> you know how it feels when the task is insurmountable. You didn't think you could do it. Then all of a sudden, you start to gain some, some, some confidence. I got real confident. So for the first quarter, Michael scored two points. Second quarter, another two points. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I think that's four. I don't know how many guys in his career has held him to four points and a half. We ran in the locker room. We're up 10 points on the world champion Chicago Bulls. Jordan has four points. The game is over. We take home the trophy at halftime. Right? <laughs> Game's over at halftime, right? Oh, you mean there's more to play? We didn't realize it until we hear a knock at the door. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah? Two minutes to second half. What? We gotta play again? There's more to play? See, you can't smell the roses too long when there's more, there's time on the clock. See, we come through a history the past few years where companies got to smelling the roses. First of all, they were doing it the wrong way. They forgot about the most natural resource on the face of the earth, that's people. And any time when you go beyond what's, what's recommended in terms of this is the right way to do things and you start to treat people the wrong way, your business will collapse. And we've seen it from major companies to major companies to major companies because it wasn't built on the oracles of treating people the way that we ourselves want to be treated. Simple rule, simple rule, but a lot of times we miss it.
because it's so simple. So we run out of the locker room. Second half is about ready to begin. What did I do the first half? The first thing I did before the game began, I was concerned with Jordan, right? I'm still concerned with Jordan. So we're walking through the quarter. Now I want to know, how does Michael Jordan look when his company has had a negative quarter? When he's not gotten it done and they're playing from behind, the company's in the red instead of in the black? How does he look now? Is he ready to throw in the towel? Is he ready to give up and give in? So I snuck a look over at him, and this time when I looked over at him, our eyes met. We locked in. Tubby Smith, when he played for Kentucky, when, when, when those boys wasn't doing what he wanted, his eyes looked like they were bulge out his head. That's kind of how Jordan looked at me. It was like he knew who I was now. I didn't know what that meant. So we went out on the court, first play of the second half, the Cavaliers, my team got the ball. So we designed a play for our Hall of Fame center, Brad Doherty. Brad, seven foot, man, he's a big boy. And we got the ball in, the price over the ELO. I throw it into Brad. Brad turns and sky hooks. Now, if there's ever a shot that you can't block, it's the sky hook. That ball gets to its apex, and we see a long arm snatch it out of the air. <laughs> Not block it, snatched it out of the air. It was Jordan. He proceeded down court and have you seen, uh, I'm sure you've seen this, have you seen that movie uh, Space Jam? Have your kids, you know, most of our kids have seen it and grandkids. Well, he comes down the court and we got the highest jumper back, his name is Larry Nance, and Larry's standing there about ready to block his shot and just as he gets to the free throw line, he takes off flight and boom, dunks it on him. How many points he got? Six, right? Had four at half, another two, six. Come on, stick with me. All right, here we go. We went back down court. We ran the same play. Got it into Brad. Brad sky hooks it. The long arm grabbed it out of the air again. Went back down court and dunked it on us. All right, I'm going to end the story right now. Let me tell you what happened. To make a long story short, by the end of the game, Michael Jordan had 69 points. <laughs> they beat us by 20. <laughs> How many did he have in the four, first half? He had four points. He scored 65 points in the second half. And you say, okay, what's the catch here, coach? What's the catch? The catch is this. At six years old, I had someone care enough about me to put me in a position at 24 to play against the world's greatest player. I don't harbor on the fact that he made history on me. <laughs> I like to accentuate the positive. I wouldn't have been there if someone hadn't have said, can you see it? And then you have to back that can you see it with an action plan. Here, here is my moniker or my rules of success. It starts with this. And I think Michael Jordan exuded it, Larry Bird, all those guys I had a chance to play with exuded these principles, starting with principle number one. You've got to believe in you. You've got to believe in you. No matter what you do, if you don't believe in you, who else is? You are the only you on the face of the earth. You're you, Inc., the best there is. No one has your DNA. No one has the retina in your eye. You are the best you there is on the face of the earth. There'll never be another you. So you got to exude confidence in whatever you do. If it's handling your patients, you got to exude confidence. If it's working on accounts, you've got to exude the confidence. I'm sure you've heard this. Little boy runs up to his dad and says, Dad! Will you please take some time with me? Just few, spend a few moments with me and play with me. But the dad had to work on his accounts and get them turned in for the next day for business. And he said, Johnny, look, I, you, just give me a, about two hours, just two hours. I've got to get this work done, get my projection reports in, and then I'll play with you. Little Johnny was persistent. You know how our kids can be. If you tell them you're going to get them a Big Mac and you don't do it, I want my Big Mac. Well, little Johnny was that way. So just as dad looked down there on the coffee table, he saw a picture. He saw a picture of the world, and he said, oh, my, okay, picture of the world, uh, Johnny. Uh, he, he tore the picture of the world up and gave it to Johnny. He said, Johnny, why don't you go back, work on this, and by the time you get finished, I should be finished and we can play. 
Johnny was, Johnny was so happy, he was excited, man. He took that thing, ran back to his room, and he got straight to work. 10 minutes later, Johnny walks back into dad and says, dad, will you play with me now? Dad looks at him, befuddled, dumbfounded. Johnny, where, where's the project I just gave you? But dad, I'm finished. No way, Johnny. There's no way you could have put the world back together in 10 minutes. Dad, I did. Johnny, how did you do it? He said, Dad, all I did was, when I saw you tear up the world, before you tore it up, I noticed there was a man on the other side. He said, all I did was worked on the man. <laughs> Once the man was put together, I noticed the world was together. I said, wow, isn't that true of life? The biggest improvement that must be made is me. Just think about that for a moment. If we're all saying it's us, us individually, and we all just get a step or two better each day, we turn around in a year's time, man, and we'll, we'll be a huge distance away from where we were. The essence of success is working on you. How can I get better? What do I need to do? We do something in basketball that we all should probably do in life. When we play a game, we have cameras like this, and we're filming the game. Why do we do that? Anybody know? For review, we want to see what's working, what's not working, right? You go to the grocery store every year, they, they, they do something called, uh, what do they call it? inventory. Why do they do that? They want to see what's selling, right? They want to make sure what's selling is put on the front. What's not selling so well, they want to take off the shelf. What are they doing? They're accentuating the positive. They're trying to find out, okay, what's really working? Let's do more of what's working and let's either do less of what's not or let's sure up those weak areas so that we can get better. That's all a part of that self-esteem that we talked about, believing in oneself. Where do I need to show up areas? Am I procrastinating? Maybe I need to start getting on the ball a little bit more. Am I faithless? Do I, do not, do I not believe in me? Maybe I need to start doing some things to believe in myself more. Here's the other moniker. I, I feel that's very important when you talk about success and what you do uh, at nursing homes and the things that you do. The other thing that's very important is you gotta have a attitude of gratitude. There's a lot of people out here today and I see them and I call them the walking dead because they're walking around but their dreams, their goals have died because they've gone through so much in life they fail to believe that their life can change. If it is to change, guess who must change it? You, me, nothing changed until we change it, until we change ourselves and change our circumstances. So our attitudes must change. We must believe that we can have better. We must believe we can do better. We must believe that it's not too late for us to get more, to learn more, to help more people. It's attitude, an attitude of gratitude. And when I say that, that also means I gotta also be very happy with what I have now because what I have I could lose. It doesn't matter if you have a degree, don't have a degree, people with degrees are losing jobs today in this recession that we're in. It's a tough time, very tough time. So I wanna have an attitude that I'm thankful for what I have and I wanna want continue to shore me up and be positive and work on me so that I can do more things, so I can reposition myself, reinvent myself to do more things in life. Self-esteem, attitude, and then here's the big one for me and this is what's got me from that six-year-old kid playing with Tonka toy trucks, to traveling the world, obtaining the degrees, hopefully living a, a better life than what I had started out. And that word is goals, goals. And I would precede that by saying setting goals, but I don't just like to set goals. It's one thing to set goals, but you know what I like to be? I like to be a go-getter a go-getter. 
And I always use this analogy, what if, what if Coach Calipari brought those Wildcats in here, in this gym right here? Would you get pretty excited? At least you Wildcat fans? Probably so, right? And let's say John Wall and DeMarcus Cousins and those guys were still a part of that team. Let's say, let's say uh, Coach, uh, Coach Rick Pitino brought his Cardinals in this gym. Oh man, of course this gym couldn't hold them because everybody in Western Kentucky would be here. But let's just think of those coaches talking to their players in the locker room, giving the best motivational speeches that they could possibly conjure up. I could hear Coach Cal saying, man, we're the big time basketball program, the winningest program in NCAA history. We're the big blue, we're the big blue nation. Nobody's better than us. We worked all year to play these Cardinals and to win. And you got Coach Patino in his locker room talking to his Cardinals. Well, you know those Wildcats think they're the best. And when I was there, they were the best. But I'm with you now, so we're the best. <laughs> I can hear him saying that. <laughs> He'll get those guys so pumped up, man, they'll be ready to jump over the rim. So when they come out of here, referee throws them, throws them the ball so that they can warm up on each end. And I can see, I can see a, a wall taking his three-point shot, which of course he missed because we wasn't a great three-point shooting team. Uh, he, he shoots it, and there's no goal up there. I can see the Cardinals coming out here taking shots, and he missed it. Why? Because there were no goals on the backboard. Think of our lives. We can shoot and shoot and shoot, but if we don't have goals, targets that we want to accomplish, and I look at that word, and, and I'm just for the sake of argument, I'm gonna say goal instead of goals right here. If I had a board that I could write on and write that word out, goal, Goal, think about that, goal. Can you tell me a couple of words inherent in just the word goal? Who said it, goal? First, those first two letters, G-O, goal. All right, we know this is not the correct spelling, but what about the second word? All. What does that mean to me? That's telling me I must go all. That means I can't leave anything in the reserve tank. I must continue to persevere because I know things are gonna get hard. I know there's gonna be defenses in my life that's trying to stop me from reaching my goal. I must go all. And I would add out. I've gotta go all out. I've gotta go all out. I remember when I made a decision to go back and get my master's degree, I was older. I had retired from the NBA. Uh, I had to be in my early, early 40s. And I'm going to a classroom with people that were probably early 20s, mid 20s. I'm thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. These cats are sharp. These young ladies are sharp. I've been out of school 20 years. But I wanted that master's. I had to prove to myself that, hey, you can do it. You can do it. Believe in yourself. And I kept going to class, kept going to class, and things started to come back, and we were working in groups, and you know, the people that I was working with, there's the importance of team. They were giving me the confidence, I was feeding off of them, and, and then I would give them some of my uh, sage experience, because I was older. And we were all accomplishing the goal. Then a few years later, I was walking down the aisle at Indiana Wesleyan with my cap and gown on, with that master's degree. Now my next goal, okay, I wanna get this doctorate. I wanna get this doctorate. Now, education means nothing. We know that, I mean, it means something, but on, on one end, it's not to puff yourself up and, you know, not, it's not for that reason. I just have a love for learning. If I'm gonna be here, I might as well keep stretching it. I might as well be confident, I might as well have that positive attitude, and I might as well be the best that I can be. Made a lot of mistakes. Now it's trying to see, time to see if I can walk right without falling. And we all gonna fall, we all gonna trip, we all gonna stumble, but I think it was Les Brown that said, it's not a question of whether you get knocked down, but if you get knocked down, land on your back. Because if you land on your back, you can see your way up. And if you can see your way up, guess what? You can get up. So there's not anybody in this room that hadn't gotten up when they've gotten knocked down. 
you a testament of survival in here. You're a testament of, uh, we had a guy in Louisville, he, he called himself the greatest. Muhammad Ali, he was the greatest. Why was he great? He kept getting up. He kept telling himself he was great. He faked people out. He really wasn't the greatest. But he said it so much, he faked people into thinking he was. He acted himself into greatness. And that's what I'm talking about. When dad said, can you see it? I really couldn't. But I kept repeating it, and I kept acting on it, and I fell, I got up, I fell, I got up. I got a granddaughter at home. She's about uh, 18 months. Cassidy. I watched Cassidy from just an infant to where she is now. I watched her crawl. I watched her try to walk. She would stumble. She'd pull up on something and try to get up on her legs, which wasn't strong enough at the time. Now her legs are strong. Now she's jumping on the couch and jumping off the of couches and desks and everything, banging her head, doing all this stuff, because she has no fear now. She has a belief that she can do anything. She really can't, but she thinks she can. So unless one of us are around her, she's going to be jumping off the cabinets and tables. But that's that lack of knowing that I can't do it. She don't know that. When we get a, adults, we get to the point that we've fallen so much, made a lot of mistakes, and said, nah, nah, I can't do that. Nah, can't run a successful, can't run a successful uh, company, healthcare company, can't do that. Nobody in the family's done it. Why do I think I can do it? Why do I think I can pull together a team of people that can help us be successful? Guess what? You can do it. The people who are major successes in this world, from Bill Gates to Warren Buffett, they all had times where they felt like they couldn't do it, but yet they did it anyway. Wow. Wow. You're an I can person. Not I can't, but an I can person. I'll leave you with this. When you get what you want in your struggle for self and life makes you king for a day, I want you to go to your mirror and look at yourself. See what that man has to say. For it isn't your father or mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass, but the fellow whose verdict counts most in life is the one staring back from the glass. You may be like Jack Horner and chisel a plum and think that you're a wonderful guy, but the man in the mirror says you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. Because he's the fellow to please, never mind all the rest. And he's with you clear and until the end and you've passed your most dangerous and difficult test if the man in the mirror is your friend. You may fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.